Okay, welcome to PyTorch Ecosystem Day 2021. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, so excited. Uh, this is great, such a great event, such a great way to get the community together. Uh, and, and a really nice follow on from the Dev Day we did last year. Um, so uh, if you don't know me, I'm Joe Spizak. I'm the product lead here at Facebook for PyTorch. Um, and if you're part of the community, uh, hopefully we, we know each other. If, if not, please reach out on Slack, reach, reach out on Gather Town, find me later. Uh, we absolutely love to connect. And hopefully you enjoy the keynotes from our uh, some of our most prominent uh, community members, uh, Peter Belucky from uh, NVIDIA, as well as Richie Yang. Um, they're so passionate, such amazing people, um, and really proud to have them uh, speak uh, on behalf of the community. So today, I, I really just wanted to update everyone on the releases we have, uh, some of the, the newer features that we have as, uh, as part of these releases. And I wanted to start with, uh, you know, just, just giving everyone a, a feeling for uh, how we do releases and, uh, and how we classify features. Uh, I think this has been something we've done in, in blog posts uh, in the past, but just wanted to give everyone a, a, a refresher on, on the approach for, for how we actually do these major releases, um, which are getting larger and larger and larger, by the way. Um, so first off, we, we do releases every three months, uh, so they've gotten quite large again. So I think the last one had well over 3,000 commits um, between releases. So man, um, you know, with over 1,800 contributors, uh, there's a lot of code being uh, pushed into the repo. Um, and you know, so the, the, the project is getting quite large. Um, we also do maintenance releases. So 1.8.1, which is a maintenance release, is a bug fix release, uh, no features. Uh, and, and we try and do that. We try and you know have that kind of TikTok strategy of major releases and minor releases if we need them. Uh, and it kind of helps uh, you know keep uh, hopefully a good user experience. Um, we also uh, release um, on Conda, PyPy, as well as Docker. That's those are the main uh, distribution points for the project. Uh, we have um, docs and tutorials on PyTorch.org that are programmatically built and tested. Uh, so we have CI there, um, and that's maintained um, by our, our doc engineering team, but uh, has a huge amount of, of contributions um, from the community um, around tutorials, uh, doc fixes. Um, uh, please, please keep those coming. Uh, the more the merrier. Uh, we'd love to see this uh, the experience continue to be improved. Um, as far as releases go, this is uh, not something we, you know, we 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 have a post on or anything. But how we think about features. So I think you know, if you look at the PyTorch.org site, we have the feature classifications, whether prototype, beta, or stable. But one thing that we we started doing well over a year ago is is actually doing a deep dive into every single feature, um, major feature that we include um, in in the, in the release. And so this is things like testing or breaking changes. Uh, could also be uh, feedback we've acquired or the API experience um, or op coverage. Um, but we go through this very rigorous process um, for each feature and it tends to be a, you know, a, a very detailed uh, kind of uh, two page or one to two page document document that, uh, that someone puts together and we, we take a look at it and we figure out, you know, number one, are we going to include this feature in the release? Um, and number two, like how are we going to classify it? We want to set proper expectations um, for every feature that we release. And to give you an idea, in the 1.8 release, uh, we had something like 41 features that we reviewed, um, you know, across the project, and that we uh, dove deep on. Uh, so it is quite rigorous, um, and we we do take a lot of pride in, in delivering a great user experience uh, across PyTorch. Um, fifthly, we started doing about a year, year and a half ago, uh, RCs, so uh, release candidates uh, with every release, and we typically release these about one month uh, ahead of an actual uh, public release. And so we're, you know, with 1.8, I think we generated something like five or six RCs. Uh, we, we fast iterated when we saw cherry picks that we had to pull in. Uh, this is a great way to test as a community to uh, give feedback early on before the release actually gets cut. Um, so if you're interested, please reach out uh, on the Slack. Um, and uh, yeah, again, like it'd be great to get other eyes on, on these RCs um, so we can make sure that we've, we've addressed issues um, but before this, before we've actually cut the binaries. Um, and then lastly, you know, cloud support. So one of the goals we have is to, to make PyTorch as broadly available as possible um, in the most used platforms. So we do work with Azure, work with Google, and we work with uh, the AWS folks. Um, to make PyTorch releases programmatically available in everything that they they deliver, whether it's um, you know things like uh, AMIs or, or VMs, 
uh, all the way through to uh, uh, platforms like SageMaker and otherwise. And so our goal there is to basically have a, a, a you know, a, a currency level um, that is very close to uh, time to market uh, with our releases. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. It tends to be in more of the days or weeks, but our goal is actually to make that uh, uh, that turnaround or that, that cycle time as, as quick as possible. Uh, so you have the latest uh, releases um, on all the clouds. So um, hopefully uh, we, we continue to improve in that regard. So looking at the actual feature classifications to provide kind of a click down and a little bit of color, uh, the, we typically classify uh, releases in three ways. Uh, prototypes are bleeding edge features. These are uh, features that uh, probably aren't gonna be in the actual release itself. Uh, they're typically a behind a, a flag or they actually tend to be more likely in nightlies. And this is actually a good thing because bleeding edge features are, are typically fast moving. There's going to be a lot of small fixes, uh, a lot of new pull requests that, that pop up to, to make things, uh, to improve things. Um, and we want people to be able to, to quickly iterate. And so we tend to, to uh, focus our prototypes um, there. We also have prototype recipes and tutorials and PyTorch.org. Um, that um, Holly on the, the dedicated on the uh, doc engineering team um, uh, created, which are really amazing, and so you can actually play around with some of these prototypes uh, in like Jupyter notebooks and so on uh, in Colab. Uh, it's really beautiful. Um, next is is the beta level features. So these are features that are typically more committed, um, and you know we're, we're basically committed to seeing these through stable. So you know in prototype we can kind of fail fast if we need to. Uh, as a community and, and find areas that maybe aren't, aren't you know, worth investing in or worth investing in. And then we typically will take those to the, the, the ones that we want to take forward into beta. And beta is, is going to be part of a release. Um, typically, it's uh, pretty feature complete, um, but maybe uh, it doesn't, isn't performant or maybe it doesn't have full documentation or maybe it doesn't have full op coverage or whatever. Um, uh, these features are also not uh, uh, committed for backward compatibility. Uh, so uh, again, these are these are uh, typically very very uh, uh, you know well well you know implemented features, but they um, but they are being iterated on somewhat. So the API may change or, or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, you know, but there are basically a number of features on the project that that uh, you know are, are kind of in the state. And what the hope is really to graduate those features into stable. And stable features are uh, you know performant, well documented, uh, typically have full op coverage, um, and you know, from a breaking changes perspective, um, you know, the goal is to not to, to basically have them as stable, as sta uh, stable without any, any BCs. Um, BCs, of course, still happen. That we do uh, typically uh, roll those over multiple releases. You know, typically uh, have a warning, and then we'll do a deprecation. Uh, more realistically, though, we we will actually keep uh, uh, things around for for a long time. We want to make sure that that we don't break people uh, unless we actually absolutely have to. So now I want to just click down into some of the, the newest features uh, from, from the latest release just to give everyone a flavor of, of what we have going on. So starting with the front end APIs, uh, you know, we have uh, this thing called torch.fx. So you know, this is a, a feature that was, um, you know, we didn't th actually think it was going to get, get as broad of attention as it, as it got, but, but uh, you know, the, uh, the team was, was really pleasantly surprised on how excited people uh, got over this. And so really, this is all about functional transformations in the Python regime. So this is Python to Python uh, code transformations. And more specifically, things like you know, transforming uh, your NN module. And so let's, let's show a little bit of code and talk a little bit about more what's, what uh, Torch.fx is composed of. So the actual uh, toolkit, or the, the, you know, the, the components um, are number one, a symbolic tracer. Uh, number two, an IR. So it has this thing called FXIR, which is some intermediate representation. And then three, it has a cogen uh, in Python. So really three steps. Uh, one, you, uh, you know, acquire a graph. Um, you will, number two, write a transformation or write a, write a, a pass. Um, and number three, you'll generate a new module. And uh, what we've seen actually is this is great for um, implementing things like quantization. So the new uh, graph mode uh, based um, quantization that was re released in prototype fairly recently um, actually uses this under the hood. Uh, so we call it the FX graph mode quantization. We've also seen uh, improvements in performance. Um, so if you're serving, for example, um, you know, your models and uh, you can actually write passes and do uh, improvements and get latency uh, benefits. Uh, and there's also some benefits obviously in training as well. So anyways, this is a general toolkit um, that 
please check it out, give us feedback, and let, you, let us know uh, where you're seeing value. Uh, the next front-end feature is torch.linaug. Uh, so one of the, the big areas that we've invested in over time is really being uh, as NumPy compatible as possible. So the next two features here are really all about that. How do we uh, align so closely with NumPy's API such that uh, very minor code changes allow you to, to take advantage of all the greatness that, that NumPy has, but also all the goodness that uh, PyTorch brings, things like Autograd, things like uh, GPUs. So torch.linalg um, module basically mirrors the uh, np.linalg um, uh, namespace in, in NumPy. So this is, again, things like uh, uh, Kowalski uh, decompositions, uh, determinants, eigenvalues, um, and again, very small code changes that allow you to take advantage of all the goodness of PyTorch. Um, same thing with FFT. So this was a feature that we released in beta previously. It's now in stable. Uh, this is, again, NumPy style compatibility. So literally swap in your MPs for torches, um, and you basically get all the advantages of GPUs, Autograd, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and we're starting to see this be used in, in broadly in, in scientific computing, which is really cool. So moving on to uh, performance optimization and profiling. Uh, so this is actually a fairly big release we did uh, in partnership with both NVIDIA as well as Microsoft. Um, and what we've actually done is created this new namespace uh, called torch.profiler. And underneath this namespace, uh, there's actually a library called Kinetto. And Kinetto is uh, in the PyTorch org. Uh, it basically provides the GPU monitoring capabilities and tracing. Um, and there's also a TensorBoard plugin um, that is uh, available in, in that repo as well. So we have a new API. Uh, we have GPU monitoring. Um, we also support, um, of course, CPU. Uh, and there's a TensorBoard plugin. And this can uh, actually be used in, in your VS Code. Uh, so you can actually be in your IDE using TensorBoard, uh, profiling, uh, and, and doing all the things you'd love to do in PyTorch, kind of all in one place. And so some of the things that it brings is uh, the ability to you know, obviously do uh, your, your profiling of, of at the kernel level, you know, looking at mem copies, um, et cetera, find the bottlenecks. Uh, be able to uh, provide recommendations. Um, you know, so in this case, you know, it's looking at your at your your step time breakdown and actually uh, telling you that hey, like twenty one percent of your time is actually being spent like loading data. That's a problem. So uh, there's you know areas where you can actually improve there. Um, so overall, basically, it, it you know provides you the ability to just generally uh, performance uh, profile and, and and do some actual active improvements um, to your code. Um, and then I mentioned you can you can visualize in TensorBoard, so you can visualize at the uh, thread level, and then you can optimize and, and understand uh, what's going on at the op level. And there's a number of different visualization uh, uh, ways you can you can look at this. So you can actually uh, look at the say like the top, you know, pick your pick your operators and, and understand which which operators end up being the bottlenecks. Um, you can actually slice and dice um, in a number of different ways. So this is really, really nice um, because you're already typically visualizing you know, things like your training loss curves, um, maybe your data, um, and now you're able to, to profile your code um, as well all in the same place. So we're really excited about this. This is, this is already getting a lot of excitement. And then uh, the last major feature area I want to talk about is distributed training. Um, distributed training is, of course, uh, part and parcel to how we scale into the trillion parameter models, how we um, you know how the really innovation happens. How how do we you know increase our, our iteration uh, speed um, and uh, and so you know a lot of things we've been working on, for example, like our RPC framework or TensorPipe um, or some of the things I'll talk about here in a second are all in service of training bigger, faster, um, you know, uh, and, and enabling uh, either research or production scale uh, models. So, you know, if you look at um, some of the new features uh, in beta, uh, pipeline parallelism. So, uh, giving a shout out to Mandy Baines over uh, in our Fair Scale team. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at Fair Scale as this feeder library um, that is really pushing the state of the art. Uh, it's a really cool library that has a number of bleeding edge uh, capabilities, um, and this was one of them. And we actually worked really closely with that team to, uh, you know, bring this into PyTorch Core. Um, and so, for example, you know, when you're training with your traditional DDP models, uh, you know, and, you're, and you can't fit in a single GPU, this is actually a great API to try. It's a pretty simple API. Um, and, uh, you know, you include any part of your training loop, um, and th this, should, uh, this should certainly allow you to scale even further. 
the other feature I want to just call out is our DDP communication hook. Um, this is almost a framework or a toolkit in itself. Um, but basically what it does is it allows you to bypass the vanilla auto all reduce um, in DDP and actually insert your own communication strategy. Um, and this is really interesting because we have, there's, there's a number of, of like built-in uh, communication hooks that, uh, that are just available uh, at release. So we did uh, include, for example, Power SGD and for gradient compression, which we've seen um, you know, so quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit of benefit actually in, in scaling some models internally. So we'd love to, to see what, what benefit it brings for your models. Um, but you can actually apply new strategies. So you can actually define your own communication strategy, plug it into this, this communication hook um, and try something out yourself. So this is great for you know, using out of the box um, strategies like Power SGD, um, but also uh, as a, from a research perspective, it really gives you a, kind of a tapestry to, 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 you know, to, to, to ideate on and, uh, uh, and, and create your new strategies and hopefully enable new research. And then the last thing I'll mention is, you know, this was something that we've been working on for quite some time with the AMD team. Uh, we've been released in beta uh, support for AMD GPUs. Uh, this is now in the uh, install matrix. You can go to PyTorch.org. Uh, you can click on the Rock M. We support uh, 4.0.1, I believe, right now. Um, and those are you know, programmatically available uh, uh, through PIP. Um, and uh, you can... Uh, basically get AMD GPUs out of the box. And again, this is in beta, so we'd love to get feedback um, and let us know what you think. Um, and uh, we'll continue to work with the AMD team to improve uh, support. So uh, if, if you want, reach out to me, uh, Jay Spizak. You'll find Jay Spizak on Slack. You'll find me on, on uh, Twitter, at Joe Spies. Um, but if you're in the Gather Town, um, please reach out. Love to chat, love to catch up and enjoy the conference. Enjoy uh, Ecosystem Day. and. Thank you as always. Thank you for being part of the community and uh, uh, absolutely love this community and love what you do. So keep on, keep on and cheers. See you soon.